a session where we are going to uh, be presenting and discussing uh, the growth uh, report of the uh, World Bank. This is a project that was uh, uh, organized by, by, by the World Bank, but it is an independent one uh, and uh, was uh, originally headed by Michael Spence and uh, many uh, high-profile uh, experts in the field have been involved. Uh, I'm very thankful to the World Bank and particularly to Danny Leipziger, uh, who is a vice president in the poverty reduction and economic uh, management in, 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 in the bank uh, for visiting us and giving us an opportunity to uh, get an extract of uh, what turns out to be a very ambitious program that has taken, I think, about two years to uh, completion. Uh, now, with us, uh, we have uh, Professor Solo to my left, who uh, really, I don't think he needs any introduction. Uh, and if you need an introduction, you have to take an introduction to economics. Uh, or something more basic, perhaps. But, uh, but in any case, he's, uh, we are very, very glad to, that he's uh, able uh, to join us. And then from uh, Colombia, we have Professor Jagdish uh, Bhagwati. And I will sort of moderate this and maybe say a few words. But what I think is the most uh, uh, interesting here is not only to learn about uh, the central lessons from this uh, report, but also have a chance to hear from you and to compare notes, especially given the circumstances around us, the crisis that we're having to go through, and see uh, how these uh, lessons help us understand a little better what uh, should be the next uh, strategies uh, uh, going, uh, looking forward. Well, without uh, further ado, uh, let me give the floor to uh, uh, Danny. Thank you very much, uh, Guillermo. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in a fantastic uh, hall and a great institution. Um, I'm going to try in a, a brief uh, period of time to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, the Growth Commission report, uh, what it is and what it isn't. Uh, there's a lot more information that you can get on the website at uh, growthcommission.org, which has all of the background papers and uh, the, um, uh, the report itself. Uh, the first thing to indicate is that this is an independent commission. Uh, it is not a World Bank uh, report, and it went through no uh, procedures that would make it such. Uh, it is a set of observations about uh, growth. It is not a uh, blueprint uh, for growth. Uh, it prevents, it uh, presents views of policymakers, and in that context it's different from many other uh, uh, efforts of this type. We had a commission of 21 headed by Mike Spence, uh, and I had the honor of being the vice chair. The only academic is the gentleman seated, seated at the table, uh, Bob Solo. The other 18 uh, were policymakers uh, from developed and developing countries. Uh, if you have uh, any of the information on the uh, commission, you'll see that it included uh, Ernesto Zedillo, the head of the Central Bank of China, the former Prime Minister of Singapore, Monte Galawali from India, uh, Alejandro Foxley from Chile. I mean, a very accomplished group of policymakers whose ideas uh, we try to capture in this report as a way of passing on from this generation of policymakers to perhaps the next generation uh, some observations about growth. Um, this is done in a way that we hope is non-ideological uh, and very uh, pragmatic. Uh, one thing it is not about, it is not about development assistance. This is not a report uh, that talks a la Pearson Commission or others about aid. It is about growth, growth dynamics, and what we uh, know. Um, 
The commission met at least a half a dozen times, and we had a dozen workshops uh, with very uh, distinguished and serious economists and others uh, telling us what was new in particularly areas that we were not so familiar with, such as demography or climate change, et cetera. And uh, many of those papers are also available uh, on the web, and there's a whole series of background uh, papers behind it. So let me tell you what the report says. Um, it reaffirms the centrality of economic growth as the main driver of welfare improvements. Uh, we refer to sustainable and inclusive uh, growth, to be sure, uh, and growth is not the end in and of itself, but we do believe that there are very few cases, if any, uh, of major gains in either poverty reduction or welfare improvement that do not rest on long, sustained periods of high growth. Now, this may seem obvious, but uh, having worked at the World Bank for the last uh, few decades, uh, I can tell you that at least in the 1990s, uh, economic growth had fallen off the radar screen of much of the development community. Uh, there was a great attention to uh, social gains, to interventions on particular uh, areas, be it health, education, all very laudable, but not sustainable without economic growth uh, in the long term. And there was a general neglect of areas such as infrastructure, uh, which as Professor Solo's models of 50 years ago uh, have taught us, uh, is one of the main drivers uh, of economic growth. So it is, was important in our view uh, to put economic growth back on the map, to do it in a non-ideological and pragmatic uh, way. Um, and to take an admonition from uh, Professor Solo, who joined many of, uh, of our meetings, uh, who said that, well, we may know the ingredients for growth, uh, but we don't really have uh, one recipe uh, to bring it about. So I think, apart from this, the, the second major area that, I, that is different about this report is that it also reaffirms a very central role for government effective government. We are somewhat agnostic with respect to the size of government. We are not agnostic with respect to its uh, effectiveness. Again, you may say self-evident, particularly uh, in the last few months, uh, that government is indispensable. Uh, but again, if you go back to the, uh, to the 80s and 90s, there was a sense in the development uh, community, at least, that the main uh, thing was to get government out of the way. The private sector would solve most problems, it would do most of the investing, get the business climate right, get the incentives right, and everything else will follow. Uh, we tend not to subscribe to that view, although we have a very strong uh, interest in the private sector and in markets, etc. We do, we do see a very important role for government, and I'll come back to that uh, later. Uh, one of the areas that I think was different about this commission uh, was that we ended up spending a fair amount of time in the area of political leadership, uh, which is uh, not the natural metier for economists. Uh, but it turned out that in looking at particularly the 13 countries that had managed to grow at 7% plus for about 25 years, 7% just being a convenient number because your income doubles in a decade, uh, it turned out that uh, political leadership uh, and a single-minded attention to growth uh, was uh, indispensable in all of these cases. Uh, therefore, uh, although we don't see one single paradigm uh, to drive growth, we do have certain principles, certain observations, uh, and certain experience that we try to bring forth uh, in this report. Now, in mentioning the role of government, we should also be clear that we are not uh, dictating exactly what government should do. Uh, we're indicating that governments need to be pragmatic, they need to have long-term goals and visions, they need self-correcting mechanisms, uh, they need to be uh, uh, practical and non-ideological, but they need to be uh, in the game. The third thing that I think the report stresses uh, in large measure is the importance of leveraging the global economy. You can refer to this as uh, the need to catch up, uh, the need to access uh, larger, more sophisticated, and richer markets, the need to uh, adopt technology that is closer to the frontier, 
uh, the uh, need to benchmark the efficiency of your own uh, output against the world market. But we find that globalization is not an option. Uh, it's, a, it's a necessity. Now, there's some concerns, particularly with uh, this recommendation, because there's some sentiment out there which people are uh, uh, noticing, and Professor Bhagwati has written uh, about in many of his uh, public work, uh, that the public is not so happy about globalization these days. If you look at the Pew Foundation survey, uh, which was done last year, uh, you find that currently, or in 2008, so it should be even worse today, um, the, in early 2008, only 53% of the American public thought that free trade was a good thing. And this contrasts with 78% five years before. So a tremendous drop in public support, if you will, uh, for globalization. On the other hand, uh, that same question got an 87% approval rating in India and a 91% approval rating in China. Uh, I just mentioned this en passant because if you have followed the Doha round, you know that at the end, uh, the issue that broke the back of the agreement had three countries failing to agree. The U.S., 53% of the public thinks globalization is a good thing. India, 87, and China, 91. Um, I let you draw your own political economy uh, conclusions uh, about that. But um, we, we stick by our guns uh, that as part of the growth dynamics, uh, you need to... Uh, you need to globalize, you need to catch up, you need to uh, leverage the, the global economy. Now, let me turn to some areas of emphasis and or controversy that we deal with in the report. Um, I hope that at the end of this, you'll at least be interested enough to uh, take a peek. Um, but let me try to whet your appetite. Um, it makes a strong case uh, for investment, particularly in infrastructure. And I think coming back to what is expected of government, we have evidence that shows that public and private investment, particularly in Latin America, but I believe elsewhere, tend to be more complementary goods than substitutes. The notion that uh, PPPs would take care of infrastructure investments uh, has proven to be false. Uh, and even the investments in concessions and other uh, private investments in infrastructure have run into difficulty because of uh, inadequacies of regulation. Uh, one factoid that's interesting is that 80% of concession contracts in Latin America uh, that were entered into in the 1990s were renegotiated within the first five years. Um, so relying on uh, private sector for all of your investment is uh, unlikely to work, and it didn't work in the high growth cases that we examined. Not dealing with it creates bottlenecks and difficulties. Uh, obviously, government is in a good position to make some intertemporal choices, uh, basically to defer consumption today and invest to get a higher level of consumption tomorrow. The prerequisite, however, is that government has some credibility of delivering on that. And part of that credibility comes from uh, issues of basic fairness, if not equity, in the society. We make a strong case for the quality of education. Uh, we're less concerned with indicators of uh, enrollment, for example, than we are with indicators of uh, quality. And we also make a large pitch for first-time job creation. Uh, this is a little controversial because some uh, uh, neoclassical uh, uh, people would say that you should keep the government out, you shouldn't uh, be concerned about it. Uh, I think we can make a good case, actually, for some form of government intervention, even subsidy for first-time job seekers in developing countries, because if you are not getting a job between the ages of 16 and 20, uh, chances are you may not make it into the formal labor force uh, during your lifetime. Um, we also make a strong appeal for early childhood nutrition uh, for very uh, pragmatic grounds, apart from the ethical issues, which is that a failure to invest in children early uh, leads to unproductive uh, adults and a greater drain on society. Now, somewhat as an aside, I would say that if we had to pick a time to release our report, and it was released last May, the 21st, um, we probably wouldn't have picked it in a year in which we would have a food crisis, a fuel crisis, and a financial crisis. Uh, this is not the time 
uh, that is most propitious for people to think about long-term uh, issues, be it long-term growth or anything else. Uh, nevertheless, there are some connections which you may want to think about for the Q&A uh, period because as countries are dealing with these crises of food and fuel, uh, they basically have very few uh, levers. Now, I'm referring to developing countries, the ones that are most vulnerable. Uh, basically, either you pass through fully uh, the increases in food and fuel, and the food prices were in many cases doubling. If this is, you know, a uh, large chunk of your household budget, it's a big problem. Uh, same with fuel. Basically, your choices are limited. You can either uh, reduce taxes on some of these if they're imported. You can uh, try to subsidize. Uh, in any event, you have a fiscal cost associated with it. The question is, how is that fiscal cost covered? Again, you have very few choices. Increased taxes, unlikely. If you could have done it, you would have done it before the crisis. Uh, Shift expenditure from lower value to higher value areas. Sounds good, but again, if governments could do it so easily, they would have done it. Uh, or run a larger deficit or cut things that are not essential in the short term. What do you normally cut? Infrastructure, investment, things that you can defer. Not good for long-term uh, growth. I can come back to this later. But we also are very uh, conscious of the fact that the world's population is increasingly urbanized. Uh, there are more people in urban uh, settings than in rural, and most of the new poor, if you want to calculate up to the year 2020 or out, further out, are going to be in urban areas. Therefore, there's a great need for governments to invest in urban infrastructure, uh, and we make a big um, pitch for that. We also discuss demographics and migration. Demographics because among the social sciences it's among the most predictable. Except for uh, uh, wars and famines and plagues, you pretty much know what your population is going to be uh, two, three decades out. And the news is there's some regions of the world that are producing more people than jobs and there's some that are doing the reverse. At the moment there are very imperfect ways for people to move. We do have some examples of south-south movement of people the uh, proverbial Philippine nannies that end up in Hong Kong or uh, teachers or doctors. Uh, but migration is not well managed and uh, we make a, an appeal uh, for greater recognition of this as a phenomenon that can, can be managed through temporary work uh, arrangements. We also have something to say about climate change. Uh, this was an issue that Mike Spence, our chairman, uh, took a particularly strong uh, interest in, I should say he took an interest in the entire document and at the end uh, took uh, the lead in, uh, in getting it uh, put together. Uh, and it was no small feat, I would say, to get uh, uh, 19 commissioners uh, to sign on. Bob Solo and I were very easy, but you know, the others, they were difficult. Um, so to get people from totally different persuasions, uh, uh, we have Chicago school types, we had social democrats from Europe, we had quite a range of, uh, of, of views. Um, but we did come to uh, consensus on a number of things, including climate change. And on climate change, I would say, very briefly, we distinguish between efficiency and fairness, between the need to mitigate and who pays uh, for that, uh, ma that mitigation. You all know the data, which is on, absolute, on an absolute basis, uh, the China has just surpassed the U.S. in terms of absolute uh, emissions. If you look per capita, the U.S. and Canada are leaps and bounds uh, above uh, other countries and way above, uh, the, the world is way above the average that is considered tolerable, regardless of whether you think that uh, temperatures will increase by one, two, or three degrees over the next uh, 40 or 50 years. So the question really is one of burden sharing. The question is how do you make China or India or other uh, uh, new, new emitters uh, indifferent between dirty and clean technologies, and the difference is one of price, and how do you make that uh, work. We do not subscribe to the view that developing countries should slow their growth in order to meet uh, these targets. Uh, in that sense, we, we are very much in the same camp as uh, Thomas uh, Schelling, who's also uh, spoken out on this uh, issue. Anyway, I'm just giving you little snippets of, of areas that we cover in the hopes that uh, uh, some will appeal to you. Um, let me come to where we stand on controversies, because the problem with the report, uh, if it has one, is that it 
According to many of our commentators, and I, Mike Spence and I and other commissioners have given the presentation, and largely the reaction is it's very reasonable. Uh, the trouble with being very reasonable uh, is that you are sometimes not given quite the attention that you think the report deserves. Uh, when I launched this in New York at the Council on Foreign Relations on May 21st, and Mike Spence did it in London, I said that we wouldn't really be a serious report until we were attacked by Bill Easterly. Uh, and sure enough, two or three weeks later, we were attacked by Bill Easterly. Uh, not a very good attack, not one of his best. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we have a consensus on, I think, a, a large body of information, but we did not shy away from controversies. In fact, there's a section uh, that is a section called Bad Ideas, and there are a list of 20 or so bad ideas that these policymakers uh, wanted people to know about, that they were essentially bad ideas. So let me get to the controversial, a few controversial areas. One has to do with what is known as industrial policy. A lot of it depends on how you define industrial policy. I mean, we can, we can define it in a way that is very interventionist and uh, uh, industry specific. We can be much more horizontal in our view and talk about interventions for technology and for uh, markets. But I think basically the reason that we are more open-minded, I would say, on industrial policy is that we believe that there is a legitimate role for government to interact with the private sector. Now, this can be around technology, it can be around education, it can be around a variety of things depending on circumstances. How much risk is borne by the private sector and the public sector uh, will vary, uh, but we don't think that the government should be written off and uh, markets supposedly find uh, every opportunity on their own. I think it's uh, somewhat unrealistic. We are, again, reasonably open-minded on flexibility and speed of opening of the capital account, uh, which was uh, controversial, may still be, uh, and we take some views on exchange rate management and sequencing. We are open to uh, special trade preferences for Africa, which is a little bit along the lines of the Collier uh, Venables proposal, uh, in part because we feel that the, as a commission, we felt that the WTO's uh, uh, categorization of countries may not be ideal in terms of giving preferences uh, to, uh, to countries, particularly in Africa. Uh, we also are quite uh, adamant in the need for regional uh, infrastructure investments. On labor markets, which was one of the most controversial areas that we uh, discussed, uh, we had uh, two camps, uh, some that wanted to protect uh, jobs and others that wanted to uh, make labor markets uh, more flexible. Uh, the argument, uh, just to be quick about it, for the those that want to have labor market flexibility is standard economic uh, theory, so that's not so controversial. But uh, the ones that wanted to protect the job said, look, you should not uh, impose flexibility on one market when other markets are quite imperfect. And uh, there are political economy consequences of uh, let's say, going after uh, unionization or, or um, rigidities in labor markets. So the, co the compromise uh, was that we come out in favor of protecting individuals but not their jobs. Uh, so we are we're interested in the safety net aspect, but we're not uh, advocating uh, protecting the individual job because we think that there are productivity and efficiency reasons uh, to see dynamism in the labor market in the same way that you would see it um, in other markets. Now, as I've uh, given this talk, and others have given it uh, uh, in the last few months, uh, some concerns have been raised, and I think um, it's, it's only fair that I tell you a few of the criticisms that have been offered uh, towards the report and what our uh, reply is. Uh, one question is, well, what's this fascination with fast growth? You know, growth is not the only thing. Why are you fixated? Uh, seemingly as a commission on, uh, on fast growth, and, and isn't fast growth associated with non-democratic regimes, uh, at least if you look historically? Our answer to the, uh, those two questions is, for every non-democratic regime that uh, managed to produce uh, fast growth, we can show you two or three that were equally autocratic and didn't get it right. Um, but more to the point, uh, Paul Romer, who was associated with our commission for uh, much of its work, 
also said, well, you know, when I go into a plant store and I see the same plants, and they're all more or less the same height, and one is much taller, I'm sort of curious, you know, what, what's different about this plant? And I think that's the approach that we took, which is that uh, we want to know what it is uh, in, in growth dynamics uh, and in policy making that uh, leads to more successful uh, country cases. Um, there is some discussion about uh, distribution, uh, namely, in fast-growing countries, you tend to see the uh, distribution of income getting worse. Uh, what's the Commission's view on that? Aren't you implicitly uh, endorsing uh, worsening of the income distribution? My personal answer to that is uh, to look at the country case uh, of Vietnam. Um, when I first went to Vietnam in 80, 1989, per capita income was less than $150 per head. Uh, Fifteen years later, it was $750 per head, five-fold increase. The poverty rate over that 15-year period went from about 60 percent of the population to about 20. Okay? But the income distribution got worse. Is that a terrible thing? Well, beyond certain bounds, if it gets to be politically and socially unacceptable, or if people are denied access in terms of opportunity uh, to get education or to uh, access credit if it's a sign of corruption. There, there are issues. But if you can get your per capita income to uh, increase by 500 percent and you can reduce poverty by two-thirds uh, and your Gini goes from 0.35 to 0.42, uh, we are less uh, concerned uh, about, about that. Um, some people have said, well, this is an interesting report. It must be the death knell of uh, the Washington consensus. Um, the quick quip is it died a while ago. But um, the more serious comment is that we are not uh, negating the importance of many of the uh, aspects of the Washington consensus. We are in favor, and the report stresses the importance of macroeconomic management. No one's in, in favor of uh, rampant inflation. No one's in favor of government uh, owning cement factories. There are many aspects of the Washington Consensus that are totally valid and that most developing countries have taken on board. If you look at macro indicators of the 90s versus uh, 2000 prior to this crisis, you will see that for the average developing country, macro management is far, far better and that many of the aspects of the Washington Consensus have been accepted. Where we draw the line is that it is not a checklist that guarantees you fast growth or, fa or guarantees you a rapid uh, a development. We believe that the policy formulation has to be much more uh, customized, uh, but we do have certain principles that are behind this report. Uh, we discuss, as I said, integration with the global economy, uh, the role of the private sector, good macro management, effective government, and inclusiveness as five key uh, aspects of uh, a, a well-designed uh, policy. Coming up with these five was the contribution of Lord Brown, who was one of the two private sector members of our group, who said, you know, I need it on one page. I need, you know, give me the five things I need to know. Um, and so uh, that was our reply. Uh, we were also cri criticized at uh, one stage uh, by a well-known economist um, uh, and former head of a university whose name I can't mention. Uh, that perhaps this was a mercantilist report. You know, uh, we, were, we were advocating uh, using all levers possible in order to uh, grow and, and, and grow on the back of exports, and uh, that this was um, uh, not the way to go. Uh, we don't see it in that, uh, in, in that light. Uh, we also were uh, asked whether or not the adding up problem that Bill Klein looked at 25 years ago might not still be there, which is what if everybody follows your advice? You know, are the markets uh, large enough uh, to accommodate that kind of advice? When Bill Klein looked at it, China was nothing compared to today. Uh, he couldn't have anticipated its growth. And we think that as China moves up the ladder, as it will, it's going to open up tremendous market opportunities uh, for other developing countries. So we are uh, not too concerned uh, about that. So let me conclude with where the commission comes out uh, as in terms of takeaway messages, as they call it. 
Um, the first is the important role, as I said before, for government. We think the old shibboleth that you should just liberalize, stabilize, and privatize is not sufficient. It doesn't uh, meet the standard of what uh, governments uh, need to do. We see a great necessity for customization, experimentation, uh, with some uh, feedback mechanisms so that bad policies uh, uh, are weeded out. Uh, we see this as being uh, important within the context of uh, good market economics. Uh, and we see a great importance for infrastructure, uh, which is somewhat neglected. We also think that inclusiveness uh, is extremely important. We are more inclined towards looking at equality of opportunity than we are at equity in terms of the uh, outcome. But for reasons of uh, political economy and social cohesion, and in, to enable governments to make these intertemporal decisions, there has to be certain basic understanding in society. Uh, part of that understanding comes from either notions of fairness, notions of access to basic services, uh, or access to certain assets. If you look at uh, what East Asian countries did, there were certain basic assets that were broadly made available, whether it was housing in Singapore or education in Korea uh, or land. Uh, there were basic assets that were uh, made available and that government can point to to say, well, look, we understand that there has to be broad uh, participation in growth. Uh, we're asking for certain uh, sacrifices and the government is going to make certain uh, decisions. Now, the, the problem with growth is that everyone is looking for that one magic uh, silver bullet. Uh, so let me leave you with uh, the following analogy uh, to dieting, uh, which uh, people of my age might be more inclined to worry about than some of you. But uh, in dieting, people are always looking for that ideal diet. You know, are you doing Atkins? Are you doing South Beach? Are you doing this? Are you doing that? Um, and the recent literature shows that actually it's not only the foods that you eat, it's the interaction of the foods that you eat. The metabolism works in funny ways depending on what combinations of food uh, you eat. Uh, similar to economic policies, and that's why the Washington Consensus is not the way we go at things, because the interaction of policies can vary, but you need to take them into account so that you have a, uh, an integrated, co uh, comprehensive approach to a problem, not individual policies that may be at odds with one another. So the interaction matters. Uh, secondly, uh, you can have a fantastic uh, uh, diet, but you undertake no exercise. Uh, maybe you don't get such good results. So the analogy there is that the country circumstances matter and where you operate in the same policy prescriptions in country A, environment A, will not have the same impact as they will in country uh, B. Uh, and related to that, people look at, for example, longevity and they say, well, you know, the French, they live a long time and they drink a lot of red wine, they eat a lot of garlic, that must be the key. But of course, if you transplant red wine and garlic into the American diet and combine it with fast food, I don't think you're going to increase longevity too much in this country. Uh, hence, the point uh, that policy lessons are not so uh, easily uh, transferable. So this is, uh, in a snapshot, what the Growth Commission report has to say. Uh, the Growth Commission, as a commission, went out of existence when we produced the report, although we do have email contact with one another, and we, from time to time, uh, may come together again to uh, venture an opinion, uh, maybe after the G20 meeting, let's say, in uh, Washington or something of that sort. Um, but it's, uh, I think, been a fantastic exercise uh, because it combined uh, two Nobel laureates, one of whom is sitting here, who gave us tremendous uh, insight. 18 policymakers from around the world, uh, whose names you'll see if you uh, log on or get a copy of the report, uh, who were very successful in their own ways. And I'm sorry that Kamal Dervis couldn't uh, join us today. He got called away by uh, the head of the UN. But he was one of those policymakers who made a big difference in Turkey, uh, for example, um, in putting actual uh, policies in place. Um, 
So uh, with that, I would like to uh, end and turn over to Bob Solo to either contradict or hopefully uh, add to uh, what, we, uh, what we found as the commission. Thank you very much. I think if, if uh, it doesn't affect audibility, I just as soon uh, sit here. Uh, well, uh, just before this, uh, this meeting, the management suggested to me that I might usefully talk about growth prospects in a time of crisis, and I'll, I'll, I'll reserve a few minutes uh, for that, uh, I will. But I do want to say some things about the report and the process uh, in, uh, in general. Uh, first of all, as, as, uh, as Danny uh, mentioned, uh, here is this group of, uh, of 21 people, two of whom are uh, academic economists, who belong to my tribe. Uh, and I'm, I'm one of the two. The other 19 uh, are all uh, people who are engaged in, actively engaged in economic policy, most of them in, uh, uh, apart from the advanced economies of the world, and a few of them in the advanced economies of the world. And this being a university occasion, uh, I thought I might say something about uh, how it looked to, uh, uh, to one of the two lone academics in this, uh, in this group. And I have to say uh, that I came away with uh, a lot of respect, enormous amount of respect for my non-academic colleagues on, on the commission. And this is not my normal reaction. Uh, uh, Years ago, some years ago, I, I spent some time as a member of the board of directors and as the chairman of the board of directors of a regional Federal Reserve Bank in the U.S. And amongst my colleagues were important bankers and businessmen. And I used to sit there in the meetings and say to myself, well, now, you don't rise to this guy's position without having something on the ball. What the hell could it be? Uh, uh, not the case here. These, these were uh, essentially uniformly uh, intelligent, flexible people, members almost always of the political elite in their own countries, but as it seemed to me, uh, honestly concerned with the the problem of poor countries and, uh, and poor people. So I was, I was uh, very favorably impressed by this group. Now, they, no doubt they were carefully selected, uh, but anyhow, uh, I, was, I was delighted. I have to say that people in that kind of position, former or current ministers of finance or governors of central banks, or occasionally prime ministers or presidents of their countries, they do have, A, a tendency to generalize from their own experience, and B, to resent it when other people generalize from their own experience. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, uh, that strikes me as, uh, as more or less natural. And the, 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 the way this played out is extremely interesting. I hope that any of you who have an interest in, in the problem of economic growth and economic development in the, the poorer half of the, of the countries of the world will look at the, uh, at the report, will we'll read, read it and see what you, what you think. It came out very clearly in the process of writing a report because uh, when initial drafts of that report came from, uh, uh, from Mike Spence, the, the chairman, they tended to be uh, very clear, very pointed, uh, very started A, moved to B, 
There we are at B, move to C. And then successive drafts get, I don't know what the word is, uh, exceptions turn up. Yes, but uh, we have to think of this. The, the nice logical clarity gets diluted a little bit, uh, but probably in a, in a good way. I always like to stand up for logical uh, uh, clarity. As, as uh, Jagdish may remember, I have always told my students, quoting the, uh, the New Testament, that there abideth these three, faith, hope, and clarity. And the greatest of these is clarity. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I think I had to agree that at each, each step, uh, loopholes were being closed. And, uh, and thoughts were, were being expressed. Uh, I was going to say that facts were being stated, but they're not facts. They're, they're, they're interpretations of facts were being stated that, that made good sense to me. And, and uh, I'm now incapable of looking at that document and knowing how much of the logical structure remains. But it was a, it's very interesting, and, and I hope that, uh, that you will look at it. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, Danny didn't mention about the, the process of constructing this r report, and I attribute this to, uh, to Mike, to Mike Spence, was it took a very inductive approach. We started with the, there, it turns out that there are exactly 13 cases of national economies that have grown at a rate exceeding 7% a year for 25 years in the world since 1950. Now, 7% growth for, for 25 years would multiply the starting number by about five and a half. So that's uh, in, in one generation to multiply income per head by five and a half is probably noticeable on the ground. But we started with those 13 cases and then asked what do they have in common? What might be, what would a reasonable person looking at these 13 histories say uh, well, it looks as if uh, it helps a lot if thus and such, or if thus and such, or if uh, if something uh, uh, something else. And Danny has has mentioned most of those things. We found uh, five, I guess, roughly generalizations that you could inductive generalizations from these thirteen uh, cases. And, and that led us to some general injunctions to uh, countries, poor countries, that would like to experience a long period of sustained and very uh, rapid growth. That's, that's why, that's, that's where we concluded, as Danny mentioned, that you simply have to depend on a committed and credible and competent government. And that in particular, a real problem that is faced by countries that want to experience this kind of growth is how to get the state's involvement to run across changes of party, party changes of government, so that the, the commitment has to perhaps outlast uh, one party's uh, control of the uh, uh, of the government. So we found uh, five or six such generalizations. It's uh, these are not the kinds of conclusions that an economic theorist is used to, but they're informed by economic uh, uh, theory, and they struck me as uh, as very very dispensable. And, and this Danny did mention uh, and emphasized uh, quite rightly, uh, 
There is no way that anybody reading these 13 histories could come away with the belief that laissez-faire is a good recipe for rapid economic uh, for rapid economic growth. All of these countries were market oriented, uh, but that's very important. Although these days, I think quite properly, we realize there isn't really isn't any alternative to market orientation. But this was market orientation with a broad scope for policy, even uh, industrial policy of one kind or another. Although I have to say that the commission uh, very conventionally and probably uh, rightly conventionally shies away from the process of, uh, uh, of, uh, of picking winners. So uh, that's roughly all that I wanted to say about the report in, in general. The other, uh, let me see, I made some notes while Danny was uh, talking, but he, uh, uh, well, let me, let me comment on two other uh, points that, uh, that Danny made, simply to supplement uh, what he said. Uh, he was right, certainly, to say that within, this, within the commission, it was impossible to get any kind of agreement about on the labor market issue. But I want to be a little more specific about that. The, the issue about labor markets often focuses on the question of informality, of the fact that in many uh, poor to middle income countries, uh, there remains alongside a formal labor market uh, where the employers tend to be fairly large companies often engaged in interna actively engaged in international trade and there is uh, uh, there are regulations about health and safety and there may be collective bargaining and things like that and alongside it alongside the formal labor market is this usually often very large informal labor market where no rules apply at all. And the, the, what pass for firms are very often family enterprises with a mere handful of employees uh, and uh, uh, who scrape a living largely because they, uh, uh, there are no regulations. The question is what what do you do about that? What you, I mean, what does uh, a maker of economic policy in a middle-income country do about this uh, issue of informality? The, the, the laissez-faire type argument is, well, you certainly want to allow the inform workers in the informal sector free access to the formal labor market. There should be no barriers to that. And, and, of course, that would immediately drive down wages and erode uh, uh, health and safety and similar regulations in the formal uh, sector. And so it's opposed by, uh, by trade unions, by whatever labor movement there is, uh, and by uh, the center-left of the political uh, uh, world in countries like that. And the, the alternative argument is, come, come. The only claim we have, the only kernel of a modern economy that we have in our country consists of this formal sector. Why would we want to turn it back to uh, the, the kind of informality which is exactly what we're trying to escape? Uh, the commission uh, waffled, and uh, I, I don't, didn't see much alternative to, uh, uh, to that. Uh, but it, its suggestion, the, the, uh, I'm groping for an adjective and not finding the right one, but its suggestion was that it might be a good idea to try to create a, uh, an alternative track 
that would lead the informal sector toward the kinds of safeguards that the formal sector already, already has. Uh, create new export zones where products in the informal sector could get a little help in, uh, in getting entry into in international trade and, uh, uh, and just try to create, to, to bypass the issue and find a circu more or less circuitous way for the informal sector to uh, uh, get a little he extra help, a little extra treatment, a few extra tax advantages or subsidies in the hope of, uh, of leaning it toward the modern formal sector's uh, status. I, I have no idea whether this will work or not, uh, but it, I certainly couldn't think of anything better, and, and so that's, uh, that's where we stand. This is a very hard problem. This is a problem that middle-income countries face and that they are going to have to deal with. I personally uh, am afraid from observation. Observation means, you know, for one week I got to look at this in one, pl in one place. I'm not uh, uh, knowledgeable about, about these things. That it, it seems to me very important to keep the informal sector from reproducing itself, uh, that it's not the way in which one wants to go, but I don't really know how it can be done. On the issue of inequality and inclusiveness, I think Danny put it very, very well, described to you uh, exactly what the situation is. I think that, that it's very important that is, he, that is he, if you let me remind you, he pointed out that there are instances in the history of some of these countries in which uh, uh, there was dramatic reduction of poverty, but simultaneously uh, an increase in the Gini coefficient. That is, so somehow inequality was increasing. I think it's terribly important, and it's a flaw in, in the universal access to the Gini coefficient itself. Much better seen if you look at the Lorentz curve as a whole instead of just at the Gini coefficient. It's very important to distinguish between inequality above the median and inequality below the median. They mean, I, I personally dislike both kinds of uh, inequality, but their meaning, their social meaning, is very different. It's really very, uh, uh, very different. Dramatic inequality below the median is immoral. Dramatic inequality above the median is merely nasty and <laughs> unesthetic. It, God doesn't like it. Uh, that, that sort of thing. And by the way, there's a lesson here for advanced countries as well. If you look at the history of inequality in to take an advanced country at random, the United States, uh, uh, in, in recent years, in recent years, what we have seen is a dramatic increase in inequality above the median. Uh, and it comes in large part from the domination of the financial services uh, sector over more pedestrian uh, economic uh, activity. And, and the dealing, dealing with inequality in poorer countries, I think, has to pay uh, attention to, uh, to this. All right. Uh, now let me just say, uh, uh, before quitting, a, a few words in, in deference to the management about uh, uh, growth prospects, especially in the poorer countries, uh, as they're affected by the current financial crisis and the widespread recession. I don't know that there's a hell of a lot to say that's sophisticated about uh, this. You, you would have to say, for, for a group like ours, for a commission that has urged above all that it's vital for for poor countries seeking sustainable growth, it's vital for them. Uh, I will not use the word leveraged uh, ever again. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's vital for them 
to take full advantage of the world economy, of integration into the world economy as a large source of relatively price elastic demand and as a source of uh, uh, sometimes of uh, investment capital. Well, having done that, uh, this is not a time when that kind of strategy is going to pay off. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, the more export-dependent growth in, in relatively poor economies is, not, is going to be weakened by the loss of and weakening of their export markets in, uh, in, rich, uh, in rich countries. Uh, there's just no, uh, I think there's no avoiding that. Uh, and, uh, and the advantage that comes from integration into the world economy will be less until prosperity is restored. But that's, that's a fact of life. It's not a fact of life that we thought to mention in the report, but uh, uh, it's a fact of life. It's also, I think, alas, very likely that the, uh, a prolonged recession in the advanced countries of the world will induce many of those rich countries to make concessions to protectionism that they have so far uh, managed to uh, uh, avoid. You could hear some of that during the presidential uh, <coughs> campaign uh, just ended. And that, too, will work to the disadvantage of uh, poor countries trying to uh, use integration in the world economy as a, a means of, of promoting, of allowing specialization at scale and thus promoting their uh, own growth. And of course, uh, 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 some, maybe many, developing uh, countries will import recession from the U.S. and the EU and uh, uh, and Japan. Uh, I don't know whether uh, one of the aftermaths of the financial crisis will be a downgrading of uh, investment in emerging markets as, uh, as too risky. I suppose it could go the other way. On the other hand, in the, longer, in the longer run, eventually this recession will end. Eventually something will be done that will uh, perhaps to some extent uh, insulate, I'm sure not fully, insulate the, the, the rich countries from the next, uh, uh, the worst of the next financial crisis. And that'll probably work to the benefit of poor countries. And it's even possible that the, the financial engineering, the, the uh, hypertrophy of of financial engineering that created some of the problems uh, in, uh, in the rich economies may work in the long run to the benefit of poor countries by somehow or other making it possible to increase the pool of capital that is available for investment in uh, poor countries. Just as we forget that the securitization of mortgages, although it it allowed all the trouble, it allowed much of the trouble that we now have, did serve the purpose of enlarging the pool of capital available for mortgage lending. It just did. Uh, it did it badly, but it, uh, it did it. I wonder whether uh, developing countries, poor countries, could not uh, take this opportunity to uh, the opportunity of the world recession, I, I mean, and the loss of, of uh, export markets, uh, take the opportunity to do some domestic things to strengthen their own uh, growth prospects, uh, such as uh, uh, putting idle resources recently idled resources into uh, labor-intensive infrastructure 
Uh, Danny talked at length about the importance of infrastructure uh, and the important and the particular importance it has because rapid sustained growth is is simply inevitably tied to urbanization. There is no way out of that. And that calls for massive infrastructural investments. And some of that might be doable uh, rather more intensively than in the past in poor countries using their own resources. Uh, this would also help to preserve uh, uh, internal macroeconomic uh, stability by providing uh, domestic economic activity as a substitute for uh, 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 export activity that is, has gone away because of the recession in, uh, in, uh, in the rich countries. It also occurred to me uh, in, in thinking about this since I got this injunction from the management uh, that uh, it, one of the standard generalizations from uh, uh, from what in my in the privacy of my own head I call uh, mindless international cross section regressions about growth uh, is that uh, financial depth is associated with uh, rapid growth. Uh, I think there may be some truth to that, but I think we ought to measure financial depth more in a more refined way uh, than we do. That is to say, uh, I don't know how many people in this room have had my experience of having taught elementary economics uh, for a long time, again and again and again. Uh, and there always comes a time if you're teaching an elementary economics course when you have to explain to these naive students why we have a financial system in the first place. Uh, and you explain to them what is absolutely true, that there are two indispensable functions that the financial system performs. Uh, one is that it, it collects savings, which are done all over the place, including by families and other kinds of institutions, and it intermediates between all those savers and the borrowers who want to do real investment and need to have access to somebody's savings, as well as their own, perhaps, in order to, uh, to do that. And the second purpose it has is, is transferring risk from people, from institutions and, and agencies uh, who are prepared to pay a fee to get rid of risk to to institutions and agencies who are prepared to bear it for, uh, for a fee. The risks that one has in mind in that second use are generally the risks that are, are, arise in the actual production of goods and services. And it's those two functions that are the redeeming social value of the financial institution, of, of the financial services uh, industry. If, if very rich people want to bet on whether other very rich people will welsh on their obligations or on whether the Red Sox will beat the Yankees or on, on anything they want to bet on, I'm all for letting them bet their fool heads off. Uh, but I don't want them borrowing from banks and then in the end preventing banks from carrying out the plain vanilla lending that makes the financial services industry worth having in the uh, in the first place. And in measuring financial depth, I think somehow we ought to uh, somehow uh, manage to not to count the sort of pornography of finance and, and, and uh, just, just count the part that's really involved in the financing of, uh, of the real economy, of the everyday economy. And uh, maybe if we would learn to do that, it would also, I think my, the correlation of that with, or the partial correlation, uh, after you have taken account of the kitchen sink and everything else, uh, with the growth capacities of poor countries might be even greater. And, and, and then that would, be, uh, uh, that would be worthwhile.
right, okay. Guillermo, just very quickly. Um, let me first compliment the two of you on a, on a fine report. Uh, I haven't read all of it, but I've read large parts of it. And of course, now I know even more about it thanks to these two interventions. Uh, I must say that it's astonishing that uh, 21 people managed to agree on anything. Uh, I was a member of a committee at the um, WTO. On the future of the WTO, we had only seven members. Unfortunately, two people never turned up. So if we could manage to write something decent. And the two reports, one on global migration, one from the ILO on globalization, which had 19 members each. And you can see the effect because they're lousy reports. And I think the, the way they escaped the, the whole consequence of having such a large thing is by adding two members and making it 21. And we know which two members they are. Uh, they're from uh, my tribe, Professors mm -hmm. Solo and Spence. So anyway, it's a terrific report. Uh, when I had originally read that what they were saying was, and this is from some people uh, whom I won't name, that somehow finally the report the, 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 uh, actually says that we really are no longer giving cookie cutter prescriptions. We don't believe in privatization and liberalization, God knows what else. I was a bit astonished because in science, and we have pretensions to a science, we believe that we should read generalizations of some kind. We're not going to tell 5,000 people in the World Bank to do their own thing wherever they go. Uh, so e you know, at any point of time, there's a certain amount of knowledge. You will change it, of course, in light of further experience and not. Um, but we have to say, are we going to move forward on free trade, or are we going to move backwards towards further protection? So things like that have to be you know, learned and propagated. Uh, and so I was a bit astonished that you know, the report was supposed to have gotten away from generalizations. If so, I thought it was going to be a very unscientific, crazy document. Well, it isn't, because as we have just heard, there are many things which they say which really cut across countries and which, uh, at the same time, they do not make the mistake that all these prescriptions, all these generalizations must be applied regardless of context. I've never known of anybody who actually does that. Even the IMF, uh, one of my students had actually gone and, um, you know, Yatavara, who was working with Perotti also, uh, he had gone and looked at even the IMF, which is supposed to have the worst, most draconian conditionalities because they're very narrow, focus on the money supply, fiscal policy, exchange rate. They had continuous policy reversals, and it's not surprising. So as soon as, you know, what do the Americans say? The rubber hits the road. Uh, you see automatic adjustments of different kinds. And I don't, I mean, and so the commission is absolutely right in also pointing out how the context matters. But that's like preaching to the obvious. And it's not poetry, it's just prose. And it's prose we have read for decades and hundreds of years. Uh, and so the whole thing... So this is why I think these descriptions uh, of what the report accomplished seem to me to be entirely crazy. So let me come to what actually the, the you know, what the commissioners have said, uh, which I think is very sensible in terms of generalizations. And the way I see it, I mean, having been with developmental issues from my first job in 61 in India and in the Indian Planning Commission, where my charge was to try and do something about poverty, this is before Jeffrey Sachs was even born, probably. <laughs> uh, or at least he was in diapers at most. Uh, and so that was the, uh, you know, that was a chart because all the developing countries, certainly the ones which are planning for development after the, you know, independence, had this chart. They were not into growth as such. They were into poverty because poverty was the main problem, right, which, was, which people were worried about, as Bob Solo pointed out. So what have we learned about growth? and poverty, because that's one of the things the, the commission is quite correctly focusing on. And they're saying growth matters for poverty. And I think that is something we have learned in the last 50 years. Uh, it is often customary to dismiss growth as a sort of trickle-down process, like you know, the people in a Robin Hood film you know, eating legs of mutton at the, you know, at the uh, at the table, and there are little crumbs falling off to the serfs and the dogs underneath the table. Well, that's a crazy way to think of growth. 
as far as attack on poverty is concerned. Because growth, I call, is a pull-up process, not a trickle-down process. You're creating jobs. You're bringing people into sustained employment. And I'm happy to see that the commission basically accepts that point of view and says that this is an important part. N nothing is ever sufficient. But this is a very important part of what we have learned, namely that growth, when it does materialize, and when will it materialize is a complicated process, again, as the commission points out. Uh, there are many, many aspects to it. But if growth does materialize, it is helpful. And in China and India, since the early 90s, uh, when outward orientation took place, and a whole lot of other reforms, the reforms never come in as just one dimension. So it's very difficult to take a partial derivative. But they have actually rescued, in India, uh, in 15 years, 200 million people have risen above the poverty line, finally. Before that, with low growth of 3.5% for about 25 years, nothing really happened. So economics and common sense do go together sometimes. A stagnant economy doesn't really generate jobs, doesn't pull people out of poverty. So that, I'm, I'm happy to see that that central focus of the report is very, very important. And I think it needs to be said, and you have said it beautifully, so I, I, I'm really happy about that. On the role of government, again, I think you're basically right, but let, let's see why, um, why people were, I and mean, people, if you were into development from the earliest days, then you would know that the whole ideology was in fact in favor of knee-jerk intervention. You saw a problem and you immediately said the government ought to, to solve it. It sounds logical. Gershon Kroneman wrote a book about it, uh, Economic Backwind as a Historical Perspective, where he said, if you're behind, you, you want to, to intervene to make it go faster. This, this, and to say otherwise sounds counterintuitive. So once I, you know, I, I said in a speech that the trouble about developing countries was that Adam Smith's invisible hand was nowhere to be seen because everywhere there was intervention, you know, <laughs> enormous amount. So we were coming from that in light of experience, which actually the commission records, to the center and saying, let's be more pragmatic about it. Uh, but you're not going from it. the other ideology, uh, as you know, some of my friends on this campus say, uh, we were not going from an, an ideology, uh, uh, you know, f from the center to an ideology of market fundamentalism. That is cockeyed. We're going from an ideology of interventionism to the center, to pragmatism. Not from the pragmatism to an ideology of market fundamentalism. So I think, again, the perspective that you get is, is quite important. Now, the quality of government matters. And I think that's, uh, you brought it out very nicely, because it does matter. The question, quality, in two senses. Where do you intervene? I, I think only libertarians think that you should not intervene at all. So and the debate really among all of us is, or, or sensible naturally, uh, is on where to intervene. And I think, again, if you start intervening in all sorts of industrial activities and so on, by direct investment, uh, public sector getting into everything, that is not very sensible. And I think as Bob pointed out, very, you know, he taught, taught that to us when I was in, in his class, uh, Industrial policy in that sense doesn't really make much sense. And then he put it dramatically, which he didn't do today, but you know, I always quote him. He said, I know there are lots of industries where there are externalities, where the social marginal product is $4, but the private marginal product is $1. He said, my problem is, I don't know which ones they are. And the trouble is, the lobbies always know which ones they are. All right, so, so industrial policy is a tricky instrument. And so we, I think on the whole, we say, like if you want to support industry, uh, support it broadly, uh, like through R&D and so on. So not non-governmental intervention, but of a kind which really doesn't get captured by people. So I think that, and the third thing I think I would say is that the, um, on the quality of government, is that governments are frequently corrupt. Now that means it is very hard to say and you just have to talk to NGOs who try and funnel aid directly to other NGOs rather than through governments, right? Because they're afraid that a lot of it will be wasted and so on. This is a common problem. And it's not a right-wing or left-wing thing. It's just simply facing up to the facts. And then you may then decide that, look, we have to be even more careful about where, the, you know, where we'll work, work with the governments in specific ways in terms of activity. It doesn't mean you just don't act. Uh, it just means you have to be 
prepared to interact. In fact, I, 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 if you read Adam Smith, for example, very few people read him. They just quote him from indirect sources. Uh, he does actually uh, talk about the quality of government. Um, you may not know, actually, that he and David Hume, the two great men of their century from the Scottish Enlightenment, neither had a vote. It was an oligarchic government, you know, with rotten boroughs and so on. In my judgment, he was basically comparing a co corrupt government with a laissez-faire government. And much the way we have to worry about this today. When it comes to Be Jeremy Bentham and the mills, they, they are already talking about better governance. And then they begin to talk about you know, getting away from laissez-faire because then it begins to be important, to, to be feasible to think in terms of actual intervention. So actually, historically, if you read the original writers on this, you will find that the nature of government deeply affects the way they think about lace affair and governmental intervention. So again, I think I would like to, 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 to really emphasize this particular point. Third, I think, uh, in terms of the integration of the world economy, I think the, the report basically says quite correctly that there are gains to be had from integration into the world economy. And I think there's a lot of evidence for that, and I, I'm, I'm sure in some of your supporting papers you must have had it. And the World Bank has done excellent you know, work David Dollar and others on this issue. So I think that we do know is another thing that we, you know, too much inward looking uh, uh, out of fear and worrying about how integration of the world economy will lead to disintegration of your own economy. Uh, we, I think, have surmounted some of those fears in the developing countries. And ironically, as Bob was pointing out, those fears have come on to our side of the I mean, to the rich countries, and managing that here <clears throat> is very difficult for our policymakers here, you know, for our executives and for President Obama and so on, than it is for uh, Prime Minister Manmohan saying, or, you know, <clears throat> and, I mean, Indians and Chinese and so on and so forth. So that is, again, something which requires, um, I think, a message saying, yes, look, it is, there are gains to be had here. This is part of a good policy framework. And so we want to do this. I would just simply say on, the, on poverty and inequality, this, this is a form in which <clears throat> I think the issues are coming up now. So very quickly, I'll just say that we need to dis distinguish sharply between poverty and inequality. Bob pointed out correctly the problem with even dealing with the Gini coefficient. You want to look at the Lawrence curve. But any kind of inequality measure, you have to put it into the social context. Like, I mean, we live here. If we go look over this side, and see Harlem, really poor. And then we, we can't look backwards, at least I can't, but you know, right over there, you can. And there you've got Park Avenue, right? So it's Soros, Rubin, and all these guys. Their wealth is multiplying by the day, it certainly was. I hope it's come down now due to the financial crisis. But did, it, did that lead to massive discontent at this end in Harlem? They're not even aware of what's going on up there. And if they are, maybe they think it's a terrific thing because the size of the lotto has increased because they think they might have a shot at it. But, I mean, there are a variety of things like that. So I think just saying inequality, uh, I, would, I think that's what Bob was basically saying. Uh, let's be careful and go into it. Uh, but poverty certainly has declined, as I was saying, in, in some very important countries which have opened up to sort of modern, what are sometimes called neoliberal reforms. If that's happened, then there is a real question, and I think I, I just know the India well. I don't know China equally well. Uh, in, China, in India, the debate is between those who think that as a result of trade and other reforms, rapid growth has reduced poverty. So what has happened is that people are now beginning to see poor people that change is possible. So like Oliver Twist, who asked for more and got less, uh, or unlike him, they're asking for more, and in a democratic setup, they're able to effectively ask for more. Uh, they're throwing out the incumbents and so on. Uh, and they're really, and the fact that it's a liberal democracy, you've got uh, NGOs, you've got opposition uh, parties, you've got a relatively independent press and a relatively independent judiciary, four elements of a democracy. That is lead, enabling them to really have an effect in terms of you know, translating their aspirations. Into, if on, and if, on the other hand, you feel <laughs> that inequality matters, that in the urban areas, 
incomes have grown dramatically, and in the, in the rural areas, they haven't grown as dramatically, then God help you, as <laughs> this Bob invoked God. Uh, and that is because most people will blame the growing inequality, whatever way they measure it, on things they don't like, like globalization, even though no, or, or reforms. They have no connection which they can establish, but that is the way they talk, and therefore there's a huge movement in India also against reforms, saying reforms have brought about inequality in the way in which they're, you know, measuring it. So there's a real issue here, you know, in terms of sustainable, you know, growth path of the kind you like, Bob, which is that if it is, if you're going to focus on what I think we should, namely bringing up the, the, the bottom 30% into you know, above the poverty line, which I think is a moral, morally comp compelling objective, then I think uh, their growth strategy and all the other things they say in the commission is very important. But if we think inequality is, is the problem, that's a much more complicated thing. Uh, and I think that is where I, I feel uh, there are some studies like Al Stepan here has gone and looked at data and asked the peasants, you know, in, in India, in the last five years, have you improved yourself? And they, over 60% say they, yes, they have, which sort of corroborates in a marginal way. You know, it needs much more exploring, uh, the, the more optimistic scenario. So I would say, look, uh, this is absolutely important. Maybe you want to then go on and you know, add in case you don't have this. And finally, on the silver bullet idea, I totally agree there's no silver bullet. I mean, we have these generalizations. But I was on a commission for, uh, on the NEPAD process for Kofi Annan uh, on, on Africa. And it was clear that in the African countries, aside from the civil unrest and so on and so forth, the main problem which they had, which certainly doesn't exist for India, for example, or China, was lack of skilled manpower for every conceivable thing you could think of. Like if you want to get into EU markets, uh, say they get liberalized on agriculture, they will immediately, you have to worry about pesticides and all sorts of things, right? Where do you get the manpower to be able to, you know, the, 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 the scientists to be able to handle WTO cases and complaints, which are de facto protectionist complaints? Keynes group countries will be able to manage it because they have the resources, the human manpower, but these countries don't. AIDS, malaria, everywhere there are shortages. So you've got shortages down the line. If you ask me what is the key thing to do for Africa, assuming we generalize, because again, Africa consists of different types, I would say skill manpower and, and the ability to mount a, a massive attack on that. But that is not something I would say for, uh, <laughs> for many other countries uh, or other continents. So certainly there's no magic bullet, but we have, we can learn from, uh, once they, you know, you bring in this manpower or skilled manpower effectively, and I've, you know, some of us have some ideas on that, then the fact that you should have an open economy and that you should exploit the gains from trade, uh, you shouldn't have too much knee-jerk public sector and intervention, you should use markets a little more pragmatically, all of that kicks in. So all those, con you know, those generalizations are still relevant. The order in which you introduce them, the speed, all of these are subject to, 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 to really looking at the specifics of the, of the situation. But these basic lessons and generalizations which the report underlines are impeccable, in my opinion, and they ought to be widely advertised. So I, I congratulate you on the report, and I, I am really delighted that it's available uh, and that it will play a major role in, 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 in propagating good economics and, and, and good development, which is a moral concern for all of us. Thank you. Okay, now we can move to the Q&A section of this uh, uh, meeting. Uh, but let, let, me, let me say a, a few words uh, um, that were, are inspired by, by what has been said here. And uh, trying to look forward because I'm a little, I'm very, very concerned that this crisis, uh, if we uh, get together in a year time, we may conclude that we have pushed back the clock for several decades, that uh, the kind of uh, growth that we have seen uh, 
in the last uh, uh, 20 years uh, has changed completely, that the problems in emerging markets are now very serious, and we are sort of going back to the 50s with a lot of protectionism and so on. I think the conditions are there for that to happen, and it depends very much on what uh, I think the advanced countries are going to do looking forward. So sort of a complementary uh, a, a, a comment to, uh, to, to, to the report, and I'd like to hear the reaction from from you guys who have been uh, looking back and, and, and assessing the, the relevance of domestic policies, what I'm going to do in my comments is sort of opening up the door to the rest of the world, sort of external factors and what the external uh, world can do for, for emerging markets. And the question is, can the emerging markets do, I call it emerging market, developing countries or poor countries do something for themselves? or oh, this is a situation where it will be very, very critical that the North uh, does something for the world. That, my opinion is that the North has a lot to do here, otherwise it will push back the clock uh, seriously and, emerge, and, and developing countries will have very little to do. Now, I, I think certain, some of the problems that we have are basically simple, even though they, they look awful and, and they are awfully complicated. Let me start, I was inspired by the comment by Professor Solo on, on the roles of the financial sector, and he emphasized two. One is the transmission or helping to savings become investment, and the other is the sharing of risks. But I think there is a third function that the financial sector uh, has been playing, and the guys down there, uh, the rich guys, <laughs> Uh, uh, they, uh, they have made money uh, uh, not so much because they know a lot about the countries where they were investing, but because they were inventing new instruments. Uh, so in a very uh, a, a, a simple way, to, to simplify, uh, what, they've been, what they do is to economize on money because money is barren, doesn't, you don't get interest on money, so, but if you intermediate money, and uh, your liabilities are very liquid, then you're paying interest on money. And that's very good because you get a fee and so on and so forth, but you take risks. And so we have this shadow financial sector that has been developing, uh, but as we know from lots of experiences in the 19th century, uh, that can uh, just go down like a, like a, uh, a castle of, of, of uh, I mean, like, uh, cards. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, and that's why we invented the, the central banks and the idea of lender of last resort. So we don't have a lender of last resort for the world as a whole. Uh, so one simple solution, simple solution to this is to have a world central bank. The IMF is not there. So should we go in that direction? Is that a good idea? I don't want to elaborate on that. But if we could go in that direction, maybe what we are seeing now would not have been so, so, so dramatic, and especially there would be an additional protection for emerging markets. Actually, the central bank, the Fed, is giving, uh, is giving uh, 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 offering currency swaps to, uh, to uh, several countries and also to advanced countries and so on, and the, and the IMF is also working on on those facilities. So it seems that we are going in that direction. The question is whether we are going to go uh, fast, fast, fast enough. But it is as if we were, in a way, groping to a, a well a, a central bank. Uh, so I think that's one of the things that we're missing here. Now, I, don't, I, don't, I cannot be very uh, sure, uh, confident, or, on, on, that, uh, on, on, on that outcome. I think it's going to be very clumsy. It will take a lot of time to, uh, to get there. So before we get there, uh, I think we're going to get a tremendous credit crunch in the world because there is a, a lot of unraveling and in the process of unraveling, destroying money, that's what we are doing. We are destroying money, and in destroying money, you destroy credit. And you tend to destroy credit even more for, for the sectors that have is a weaker collateral. So that's, that's why my concern that that could have 
a very serious effect in, in poor countries. So the question is, what can the poor countries do in that context? Uh, and what can the, uh, uh, the World Bank do in that context? Is there, do we have instruments uh, to help? Now, I, in that sense, I think if you had published the, 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 the book now, you would have a lot more support for the idea that government should play a central role. Because I think what's happening now, momentarily, is that for, for the weak sectors, there is no credit. So in order to, and who is getting credit? Credit is the treasury. The treasury is getting credit at zero interest rate. Uh, so if you get credit at zero interest rate, you have this, as uh, Bob said, savings is looking for investment, and, and now all of a sudden there is no, 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 because I started the story with uh, talking about money, but it ends up being a story that has implications, as Bob said, and the destruction of money has implications on the real economy and destroys that channel that yeah. makes savings uh, to get transformed in, into investment. So you don't have that channel. So, but, but savings are not very willing to go into treasury bills. So in the short run, who the, the, lend, the natural lender in the world must be the treasury. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a fiscal lender. I mean, that would be the natural thing to do, right? Leaving aside all the political complications and incentive complications. So I think that's where in the world where we are. Uh, and the World Bank is the right hand side of the Treasury. So it's in a, in a, in a, in a very good position to do that for emerging markets. It has the support of the G7, so it has the trust that, uh, that the Treasury has and has the ability to lend and has already an institution there with people with a lot of uh, experience in lending to sovereigns. So it seemed to me that the, the, the role in, in, in the next year, at least, or the next couple of years, uh, what you guys are saying, the importance of, of the, uh, the government, I think it will have to increase. And I see the, 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 the bank uh, playing an important role. There. Now, how much more important? I did some numbers for Latin America, and com if you combine, you combine the loans in uh, 2007 uh, between uh, the IDB and the World Bank to Latin America, that the gross loans, not the loan, net loans, represent 2% of the region investment. Nothing. So, if, if there is a sudden stop on the region and therefore investment falls because there is no credit, you would need, I figure, at least to increase the size of that five times. Now, that requires a very strong uh, leadership on the part of, uh, of, the, of the G7. And I think there the, the bank or the banks can play a very, very central role because you have the information. <laughs> You can convey it in a credible way. I mean, you, you are the lending hand. And so that uh, I see now the, a role for the bank, uh, which is, could be very critical, and at least in the next couple of years. I don't know. I'm hoping that later on we can go back and say uh, uh, we have another consensus, which is very simple-minded and so on. But uh, momentarily, it seems to me that the bank, uh, and in that context, I realize that uh, you sort of downplay the role of PPP. Well, maybe now we, we want to revise that, because PPP uh, has one advantage. If, if it can, I know the difficulties, but an advantage now is that uh, you don't need that the, that the bank uh, provides all the money you have the private sector. The private sector is eager to invest, and it will be eager to invest in, product, in, 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 in attractive uh, projects, but they don't, they don't trust the intermediary. So if they can trust the bank, and I think there are gonna be very few outlets uh, in the short run. So, and, 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 emerging, and, and developing countries are undoubtedly, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's an area where, where capital should go in principle, uh, so that uh, maybe PPP will, that, uh, well, the advantage I see on PPP, about PPP is that um, it, it uh, lowers the, the, the capital requirement. 
uh, additional re uh, capital requirement. So with that, I just say all of this because, well, it sort of opens up uh, perhaps it's related to what you guys say, but uh, I'm t just trying to put this into into the present context. I, I you didn't mention it. I, I read the, the not very carefully the, the report. Let me just end by saying I don't see much emphasis on the role of the domestic financial uh, sector, and the domestic financial sector could be quite critical in, ter in intermediating. They have the, the domestically. Uh, and the strengths of that sector, I think, uh, could make a difference, but let me just, uh, I, maybe uh, we don't have a lot of time, and I'm sorry I took it, uh, more than I expected. Uh, maybe I, I can take two or three questions from the uh, floor. There's a microphone on the left-hand side of the Yes, please speak to the microphone because we are uh, taping this. I wanted to ask, uh, I do not see in the report a mention of private property rights. And I worked on privatization in Eastern Europe for the World Bank and other organizations. And now I'm finding out that there are virtually no private property rights in Eastern Europe, despite all this privatization policy. And that uh, the property rights that there are are based on sort of socialist notions from 1950s. And it is a major bottleneck on uh, growth in these countries. <coughs> Yeah, it's yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah I wanted to follow up on, on Guillermo's very interesting comments. Uh, just stressing, uh, you, you emphasized a lot the role of infrastructure in growth. And one of the things that typically falls dramatically after crisis or during crisis is investment in infrastructure. Uh, it happened after the Asian crisis. I'm sure it will happen now. And there will be also, I think, the added uh, problem that we need to invest a lot in clean technology, low carbon technology. And I've just been talking to a lot of people who are finding it very difficult, of course, to invest in that at the current credit crunch. So I think these are like two natural roles that, that could be played at a, on a very large scale by the World Bank, by the regional development banks, and also perhaps um, by developing countries themselves to the extent that they have much more of their own resources now uh, accumulated in reserves. And so I think the complement of that uh, between World Bank, uh, regional expanded banks uh, could help replace the private sector uh, during uh, a critical moment to help sustain growth. Um, the other thing is I wanted to ask, because you emphasize a lot um, that the, you know integration into the world economy is such a good thing, and I think that's probably true uh, on trade. How could I say something else with Professor Baguati sitting there? Uh, but on finance, I think even before this crisis, the evidence is actually uh, not in that direction. It's not just Danny Roderick, but the series of studies that the IMF conducted with people like Prasad and so on, showing that actually capital flows do not contribute to growth, do not contribute to smoothing consumption, and so on. Um, and finally, I wanted to um, uh, build a little bit on, on the very interesting comments that, that uh, Professor Solo made about inequality and its link to the growth of the financial sector, particularly in the rich countries. Um, and I think that that is a very, very valid observation, which is not stressed enough. So I'd be really interested to hear more of the evidence. But also, sort of in a way, almost naively, but really, I think quite deeply, I would like to ask why is the private, sect the private financial sector paid such high uh, salaries for doing things that are not socially useful and that can be even disastrous? <laughs> And, and, and what can we do about it, I think? Is, is, is actually, it's a good moment to ask now because the financial sector is, is, is very weak and is getting a lot of rescues. Um, and, and, and finally, along those lines also, what can be done to develop, not just to regulate the financial system so it doesn't do all these silly things that are so harmful to the real economy, but how it could create instruments that, that would actually help enhance its contribution to the real economy. Thank you.
Okay, that, that, that will be the last can, question. Can I, can I, might ask, first of all, I want to commend uh, the, uh, Danny Leipziger and the authors of the report. Um, I just say this, I was U.S. Director on the board of the World Bank for four years, and Danny was laboring in Latin America in the trenches trying to get people to think about the importance of many of the items included in this report, and he spoke from the heart, I think, talking about the fact that growth was a dirty word uh, for a number of years and that infrastructure was, there was not even an infrastructure department at the bank until the board, uh, thank, I, I'm very happy to say, uh, took some great steps in the 2003, Danny? 2003 to get it uh, put back as part of uh, awareness. Um, I, I'd like to just follow up quickly with what the uh, speaker, the questioner before me uh, said uh, about paying the private sector too much, you know, for doing harmful things. Um, I'd just like to ask why we've been paying regulators for not regulating. Um, because I think what we've had here is the failure to regulate, and it doesn't mean new constructions and new this and new that. If you don't know what you're regulating, then you'd better not be allowing the people you're regulating to do some of the things they were doing. Anyway, what I'd like to get into here, though, in brief, is talk about the fact that the report, to me, what's important about it, it does talk about three types of infrastructure. It talks about institutional inf infrastructure in the terms of government. It talks about human capital or human infrastructure. And then it talks about physical infrastructure as all being components for growth and how do you make them work effectively uh, together. I'd like to focus, though, right now on climate change because it always seems that when we talk about climate change and the emerging economies or the developing world, we always talk about the rich countries polluting and the poor countries are trying to grow and not getting the credit for it and who's going to get the money and how are we going to allocate the money. I see it a little bit differently. Um, if, the, if the emerging countries today are developing their infrastructure, they have the opportunity to develop state-of-the-art greenfield infrastructure using state-of-the-art technologies and green technologies in a broad range of, of areas. I'm working on some of these right now. Whereas the industrial economies, uh, it's not as easy to retrofit and to change and convert existing technologies that have been in the ground or in buildings or whatever for decades, if not centuries. And the capital cost of doing that, not just the capital cost, but think about replacing the sewer system in New York or doing some of these things. It's much easier to put in greenfield than it is to, to try to retrofit. So I would tend to think that emerging countries that are on a growth trajectory with real leadership are going, really should be looking at climate as a new opportunity to enhance their growth prospects and their competitiveness. Thank you. Okay, now we have a couple of minutes. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, respond in the uh, general area of what the World Bank can uh, or is doing, which responds a bit to the question of um, our role in, in uh, providing uh, countercyclical uh, financing, uh, also our role in uh, dealing with the current uh, crisis, um, etc. Well, I think the, the, the quick answer is that uh, the good news is, well, there, there, there are two pieces of good news going into this crisis. The first good news is that developing countries actually were much better positioned in terms of their macro uh, levels of reserves, et cetera, than they were before uh, and during previous crises. The bad news is this crisis is so much larger than anything they've ever seen before uh, that it may not, uh, it may not matter. Um, from the bank's point of view, uh, we uh, have announced that we are willing to double our lending uh, this uh, year, uh, which would mean we would be lending closer to 30 billion instead of closer to 15, uh, which is a fair amount of money and for some countries will make a big difference. Uh, but for others, it's a drop in the bucket. And uh, even if you add up uh, what the World Bank might lend to a middle income country that has an issue, uh, with the recently passed uh, short-term liquidity facility at the IMF, which provides 500 percent of quota uh, if your macro is sound, still, uh, if a major developing country uh, ran into a problem where uh, banks decided they were not going to roll over short-term debt, 
um, for big for the government or even for major corporations, which would then become a government problem. Uh, neither the bank nor the fund have enough uh, resources uh, uh, to deal with that problem. Hence, you've seen uh, swap arrangements announced for four, uh, with four central banks by the Fed, um, and uh, there's a G10, a G20 meeting uh, in, in Sao Paulo starting uh, tomorrow, and then the follow-up on the international architecture, which I don't know where it'll go. But um, so there, the, the problem is just of, of a very large uh, proportion. On the specifics of uh, private property rights, I think you'll find it in the report. Um, I, I have no quarrel with, with, the, with the, the point you make, um, and uh, I just uh, didn't spend much time on it. The, the World Bank, as you know, spends a, a fair amount of time on its uh, doing business report, which spends, uh, I would say, uh, a substantial amount of time looking at uh, issues such as uh, property rights and integrity of investment. Um, on the uh, question of climate change, um, I think you'll find, uh, Carol, that in the report, uh, and this is due to my expense, we, we explicitly say that uh, abatement should be done efficiently. So if you look at it as a global uh, challenge, uh, you should be reducing carbon where you can reduce it at the lowest cost per ton of carbon that you can prevent. Um, it may well be that a lot of that is in newer uh, uh, environments and less in Amsterdam. Um, ergo, there are carbon markets, but uh, they are too small to, to really make a dent in the, in the need for um, uh, abatement. Um, on the financial, well, you ask a number of questions, so I'll, I'll just pick a few. <laughs> um, on the financial integration uh, point, um, and, and uh, looking at it vis-a-vis -vis trade, where you say there's less of a, a debate. I think on the financial integration uh, side, uh, there, there has been a debate, um, but I think up until now, the conclusions have been, uh, to my way of thinking, somewhat wrong. Um, for example, uh, there was a, a large debate about uh, whether Chile uh, in, the, uh, in the 90s should have had uh, an additional reserve requirement on short-term capital flows. The IMF said it was a bad policy. The U.S. Treasury said it was a bad policy. Uh, but then came the tequila uh, crisis, tiny by comparison to what we're seeing today, and Chile was largely spared uh, because they took the view that they were not indifferent between three-month money and three-year money. And from a risk management point of view, uh, uh, I think the government at that time made the right decision. Now, ex post, most economists, academic economists in Chile have come out on the other side. I was always, always in favor of it. I thought it made eminent sense. Uh, Chile is an open economy. You can't say that this is a major distortion, but it does provide a disincentive to certain types of flows, which can destabilize a relatively small market. Uh, at times of, of crisis, as we've seen uh, uh, today. Um, so if you take that uh, approach, uh, I think if you look now at the size of the potential financial problems that countries may have, uh, look at current account deficits, uh, rollovers, uh, and compare it to reserves and the sources of funds, bank and fund, there is an imbalance. And I also have a problem with using reserves because uh, markets look very carefully. Once a country starts using 25% of its reserves to help fund something, uh, the value of, this, of the next 75 is not so high because it's a sign that there's a problem. So the fact that you may, in theory, have enough reserves to cover your short-term rollover risks, um, in my view, is not, is not right. So, uh, on the regulatory side, I think that takes us pretty, um, uh, pretty far afield, but I, I would say that what's interesting to me, uh, having worked on financial crises in the, in the World Bank in, in East Asia and in Latin America, is that if you look at what the OECD countries have done, uh, the British plan or the U.S., uh, extending deposit insurance broadly, recapitalizing banks with government money, discounting uh, regardless of the quality of the assets, um, and providing either guarantees or some uh, government backing uh, 
uh, for short term uh, for paper. Uh, these are four things we usually tell countries not to do. Um, so it's sort of interesting uh, that in a moment of severe crisis, uh, OECD countries have to resort to pretty draconian government intervention, uh, which is, I think, another reason why the tenor of this report, coming back to the Growth Commission, is one of humility. We are not telling countries what to do, and we are not uh, 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 claiming that uh, the rich countries have gotten it right, and all you need to do is follow uh, that example. We took a more, much more humble view before this crisis, and I think it is deservedly so uh, after the crisis. No, I, it's, getting, it's getting late, and, and on, on some of these issues, I'd be in over my head anyhow. I, I do want to, I can make just one brief uh, comment about why there are such enormous uh, salaries, take homes in the financial sector. It's, I think, uh, uh, a great discovery. Uh, you know from the enormous sums at stake in the financial markets that what you're hearing about is gross totals not net totals, and I think financial, the financial services industry has found a way of remunerating itself as a percentage of gross, not of net. And so they, uh, uh, they collect large sums of money. I wish I knew a way of doing that. <laughs>